Russia's defense ministry says the safe zones agreement for Syria will come into effect from midnight. I'm Fuli Batibo. You're watching Al Jazeera live from Doha. Also ahead, it's the final day of campaigning in France's presidential election as environmentalists stage a very public protest against the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. In America, we do not fear people speaking freely from the pulpit. We embrace it. The U.S. president makes good on an election promise easing a ban on some political activities by churches. And China's much-awaited first homegrown passenger jet takes to the skies. Russia's defense ministry says the so-called safe zones agreed for Syria will come into force from midnight on Friday. The deal was agreed on Thursday during talks in Kazakhstan's capital Astana. The pact between Russia, Turkey and Iran bans the use of all weapons and allows access for humanitarian aid. Russia says uh, uh, you, the support for Russia says it has support for from the UN, the US, Saudi Arabia as well. Let's speak to Paddy Colhane about this now, who joins us from Washington. So Russia's defense ministry, Paddy, saying that these safe zones agreement, as I said, was supported by uh, the UN, the US, and the Saudi Arabia as well. Any word from the Pentagon about this? Well, we're still waiting to hear from the Pentagon on the latest reports that come out of Russia. And they're saying uh, that this agreement means that U.S. warplanes can no longer fly over these areas. So we haven't heard anything from the Pentagon. I've been calling them. No response just yet. But they are going to respond in about an hour and 15 minutes. They're having an off-camera briefing at the Pentagon. My producer will head over there. We'll be able to tell you what they said. That's probably where we're going to get the first response. Uh, but it does sound a lot like what the U.S. has been hoping for. Remember, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said that there should be interim zones of stability. So what this agreement calls for is de-escalation zones. They sound pretty much about the same thing. And it doesn't appear, if you look at where we believe this uh, applies to, it doesn't really appear that that is the area where the U.S. has been targeting group, the group Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. So uh, it may absolutely mean nothing if mm -hmm. they haven't been flying in that area uh, anyway. Um, but we do know from the State Department, that was really where we got the first reaction. This came out right after the agreement. Uh, this was before we, the news came that the U.S. would be banned from the area. But initially, the State Department said uh, that they welcomed any agreement that would bring an end to the suffering of the Syrian people, though they said they were very skeptical it would work, as past ceasefires have uh, basically broken down quickly. At the same time, they said they objected to Iran being a part of the agreement. But the U.S. doesn't really have a lot of say here. They're not members to these talks. They right. sent a special uh, sec uh, assistant secretary of state uh, to observe, but they're not any, in any way part of the negotiating process. Right. And, and just to clarify, Hi, Patty. This agreement would not affect uh, U.S. operations against ISIL in Syria, would it? No, it would not. And that's really been the sole focus of U.S. air power. And again, that's in a separate part of the country where we don't believe these de-escalation zones uh, are going to be mapped out. Uh, the U.S., if it was told to stop bombing the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant without having to ask, I can tell you the response would be no. We know that President Donald Trump has made that his number one foreign policy priority uh, to make sure that they are defeated not only in Syria, Iraq, but wherever else they are in the in the world. So uh, as long as the U.S. can still fight the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant with drones, with fighter jets, with bombers, uh, likely that will continue uh, because, again, we don't believe they are flying in these zones that have been designated by these three countries. Patty Colhane in Washington, thank you very much for that. In Iraq, police say at least 81 civilians have been killed in an airstrike in Mosul. It happened in a contested neighborhood on the western part of the city. The strike targeted an abandoned school used by families escaping fighting. Iraqi forces are battling ISIL for the control of Mosul. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. Mohammed Jamjoun is live for us now in Erbil in northern Iraq. What more are you hearing about this attack, Mohammed? 
Well, Foley, ISIL had claimed through its AMAC agency that on late Thursday, a U.S.-led coalition airstrike uh, in an area of western Mosul called Al Fatah had killed dozens of displaced people. Well, we've tried to get confirmation from the U.S. Department of Defense. They have not commented as of yet, but we have spoken to a source in the Iraqi Federal Police who tells us that yes, an airstrike did happen on Thursday, that it happened in the June 17th neighborhood, a neighborhood that comprises that area of Al Fatah that ISIL had mentioned in its statement, um, and that this airstrike did indeed kill at least 80 people, that among the casualties were women and children, that these were, uh, these were people that were fleeing the fighting, the clashes that are going on between Iraqi security forces and ISIL in that neighborhood of western Mosul, that they had taken refuge in a schoolhouse there in that area. Now, the person that we spoke with has said that they are not yet sure if this airstrike was carried out by the U.S.-led coalition or if it was carried out by the Iraqi Air Force. Uh, Iraqi forces, meanwhile, on Thursday, Mohammed claimed that they were making progress on retaking uh, the western part of Mosul City. Where do things stand right now as uh, far as taking control of the entire city? This is an operation that's been going on for months now. Yeah, it's been going on for over six months now, Foley. Now, Iraq's military says that they are confident that they are going to be able to retake this part of western Mosul in the next few days. This operation, this latest offensive, this was launched yesterday. Now, it's by no means the last offensive that is going to be launched, but this offensive, they are aiming to recapture four towns, four areas in northwestern Mosul if the Iraqi army, if the security forces are successful in pushing ISIL out of those areas. That will be a huge blow to ISIL because ISIL considers those to be very strategic points for them because if the Iraqi military takes those areas, it will be easier for them to then drive deeper into the southern part of West Mosul and then try to surround and attempt to retake the old city in West Mosul. That, of course, is the last bastion, the last critical stronghold of ISIL in West Mosul. Foley. Mohammed Jamjouni Nurbil, thank you very much for that, Mohammed. Meanwhile, U.S.-backed rebel forces in Syria say they're almost in complete control of the city of Tapka. Tapka's significance is that it's around 50 kilometers from Raqqa, which is ISIL's self-declared capital. MTS Taib is following developments from Baalbek in Lebanon near the border with Syria. Well, all eyes remain on the Syrian town of Taqba, which is in the Raqqa province, as uh, SDF fighters, the SDF, of course, which is a Kurdish-led fighting force, uh, which involves a number of Arab fighting forces as well, backed by the United States and other Western powers, really push ahead in this town, trying to force ISIL out. ISIL has been in control of Taqba for a very long time, and this is a major strategic loss for the armed group. The armed group has for a very long time been in control of this area, an area which is very close to the Euphrates Dam. The Euphrates Dam provides most of the water in that area. And when you consider the fact that Dabka is only around 50 kilometers from Raqqa, the self-declared capital of ISIL, for them to lose this area would be a very significant blow. Now, we are hearing some conflicting reports as to how much of Taqba has been liberated by the SDF, uh, some suggesting that all of it has been taken, others saying only around 80 percent. Whatever the case, it would be a major blow for ISIL, which really has been on the back foot for some time. But in the background of all of that, the fighting still continues across Syria. Uh, we're hearing that uh, the regime has been shelling uh, rebel areas in Hama. We're also hearing that uh, they have been targeting other areas as well. And so while many are paying very close attention to this agreement, which has been reached between the Russian, Iranian and Turkish governments in the Kazakh capital of Astana, seeing the potential of a so-called de-escalation zone, the fighting across Syria continues. The Al Jazeera media network has rejected false reports published by the Russian media agency Sputnik. It said Al Jazeera has participated in the staging of an as yet undisclosed chemical, and undisclosed chemical attack on civilians in Syria. The Al Jazeera media network has given the following response. Al Jazeera did not film any chemical attack material in Syria. Al Jazeera will continue its field coverage of the war in Syria with the objectivity the network is known for. 
Al Jazeera will take legal action against the Sputnik agency, which has committed a crime of defamation. Uh, Sputnik is known to be a propaganda tool that defends the Syrian regime. It has published earlier reports that deny the most recent chemical strike in Khan Sheikhoun, which it called fake and staged. The attack was confirmed by other impartial agencies and the Independent International Commission of Inquiry. Al Jazeera warns that the timing of this false report may be a prelude to a real attack on civilians in Syria and could be used to cover up other crimes committed by the Assad regime. In other world news, in India, four men convicted of gang rape have lost appeals against their death sentences. Supreme Court judges in New Delhi upheld the decision made during their trial that they should be hanged. A 23-year-old woman was beaten, raped and tortured while traveling on a bus with a friend five years ago. The case provoked nationwide protests and brought worldwide attention on the mistreatment of women in India. Still ahead on Al Jazeera, grim findings in Gambia. An investigation is underway into human rights abuses. Plus, liftoff. India's space agency launches a satellite to provide communication services to its neighboring countries. Welcome back. We'll look at the weather across China and Taiwan and Indochina. And on the satellite imagery, it's across Indochina. We've got some big storms at the moment across Laos and Myanmar and also Vietnam. And the forecast suggests we're going to see more heavy showers here during the course of Saturday. Hong Kong is looking somewhat dry and brighter. Some sunshine, some showers for Taiwan, though. And then through into Sunday, still some showers across this region, particularly across Laos. It looks to be a little bit wet at times. Now, as we head across into South Asia, it is getting pretty hot at the moment. And we've got temperatures well in excess of 40 degrees across central and northern parts of India. Indeed, as we head on through into Sunday, 44 degrees could be the maximum in New Delhi. That's not particularly pleasant. Elsewhere, some showers for both the Western Ghats and also the Eastern Ghats, seeing some storms, and also some big storms for the eastern states of India. Here in the Arabian Peninsula, it's quite breezy at the moment, but the breeze is coming from the desert south, so temperatures of about 39, maybe 40 degrees here in Doha. Temperatures not quite that high on the other side of the peninsula for Mecca and Medina. And then heading on through into Sunday, the main feature is storms across the southern part of Saudi Arabia, down into Yemen. There could be some big thunderstorms in Sana. Whether via the net, let me just be open and frank. Or if you join us on set, just that one moment and somebody tells you no. This is a dialogue. Everyone has a voice. Congress can pass a law uh, overriding the Organic Act, which is in fact the, the law that gives us our US citizenship. Join the global conversation at this time on Al Jazeera. Welcome back. You're watching Al Jazeera. A reminder of our top stories now. Russia's defense ministry says the so-called safe zones agreed for Syria will come into force from midnight on Friday. The deal between Russia, Turkey and Iran was agreed on Thursday during talks in Kazakhstan. The safe zones will include areas in Syria's Idlib province, parts of homes and also eastern Ghouta. In Iraq, the army says at least 81 civilians have been killed in an airstrike in Mosul. It happened in a contested neighborhood on the western part of the city. The strike targeted an abandoned school used by families escaping fighting. And in India, four men convicted of gang rape have lost appeals against their death sentences. The Supreme Court upheld a decision made during their trial that they should be hanged for raping and torturing a 23-year-old woman in 2012.
Now, it's the final day of campaigning in France's presidential election. The latest opinion polls show the centrist candidate Emmanuel Macron is leading over his far-right rival Marine Le Pen with just two days to go before voting on Sunday. Meanwhile, 12 people have been arrested in Paris this Friday after environmental activists breached the Eiffel Tower's security that displayed a banner aimed at the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. Jonah Hall has more from Paris. Well, both candidates have been out and about on the campaign trail on this, the final official day of campaigning uh, here in France, making unannounced visits, both of them, to cathedrals in different parts of the country, apparently making a last-minute play to win over uh, largely middle-class right-wing Catholic uh, voters. A hostile reception for Marine Le Pen outside the cathedral in Rennes in east-central uh, France. She was pelted with eggs uh, once again, as she was on Thursday in Brittany by protesters shouting out with fascists. It was the end of a, a bad week for her, having been considered by many commentators, including her father, uh, of having fluffed the debate, that bruising debate encounter on Wednesday night with Emmanuel Macron. Mr. Macron, meanwhile, perhaps daring now to believe that victory is within his grasp. He got the endorsement of Barack Obama uh, on Thursday, widely uh, respected here in France, Mr. Obama, and of course he was considered to have come out on top on, in that debate uh, on Wednesday. And the polls, the final opinion polls coming out on Friday, seeming to reflect that view, uh, giving him an even wider margin now over Marine Le Pen with a prediction of 62% of the vote uh, going to Emmanuel Macron on Sunday. Algeria's ruling National Liberation Front Party and its main allies have won a majority in the parliamentary elections. The vote was overshadowed by plummeting oil prices and soaring unemployment. And as expected, the turnout was low with only about 36% turning out at the polls. The UK's governing Conservative Party has made big gains in local elections across England, Scotland and Wales. The results are being seen as a sign of support before the general election next month. Prime Minister Theresa May hopes the Conservatives will win a bigger majority in Parliament to strengthen Britain's position in Brexit talks with the European Union. Now, the debate about poor service and a lack of customer-friendly policies on U.S. airlines is back in the spotlight. A family, including two children, was kicked off an overbooked Delta Airlines flight so their seats could be given to waiting passengers. It's the latest U.S. airline involved in incidents about overbooking on flights. Alan Fisher has more from Washington. Well, initially we had a family of five that was traveling back from Hawaii to their home in Southern California. The teenage son left a day early. Uh, the family of four, mum, dad and two toddlers, then decided that they would take up the seats that they had purchased. Delta then insisted that one of the toddlers could not be seated in one of the seats. Uh, there was a row over names. It was all pretty calm, but essentially Delta was saying, you have to leave the flight. We are going to arrest you, we're going to arrest your wife and your children, we're going to foster care. And that really upset the family in particular, so they decided to leave the flight, even though they said they'd purchased all the tickets and were in full compliance with the law. Now, Delta has apologised. They say that the standards there weren't met. Uh, but this is the latest incident involving a, an American airline, an American carrier. Three of the big four, just in the last month, have been caught up in customer service incidents, the most famous, of course, being at the United flight where a doctor was dragged off the plane because they wanted to make room for United crew who had to get to another destination. And you'll remember just earlier this week, there was a congressional hearing where the airlines, Delta wasn't among them, were on Capitol Hill and essentially lawmakers said, you need to sort out this problem or we will sort it out for you. Certainly, American Airlines and I say that collectively rather than just singling out one specifically, they have a perception problem at the moment. The perception is that they are overselling flights, they are not treating their customers well, and in the long run, that's bad news for these carriers. In Afghanistan, former warlord Gulbuddin Hekmatyar has given his first public speech in almost 20 years. In a show, four thousands of his supporters gathered at a Kabul sports stadium cheering their leader and waving flags of his Hezbi Islami party. But his return is controversial, as Mariana Hond reports now. The crowd anticipates the first speech in 20 years from a man once considered Afghanistan's most wanted. Gulbuddin Hekmatyar greeted his supporters on both Thursday and Friday in Kabul. 
the leader of the prominent Afghan armed group, Hizbi Islami, who many regard as a warlord, is said to be behind bombings in the capital in 2012 and the following year. Now he casts himself as a peacemaker. I call on Taliban. They should accept the desires and demands of the nation. Come stand with us. Be united to take the country out of this current unfortunate crisis and save the country from the bloodshed. The deal that led to his historic return began at a peace conference last September between the Afghan government and representatives of Hizb Islami. He rose to prominence as a Mujahideen fighter resisting the Soviet occupation of the 1980s. In the chaos that followed the Russian withdrawal, Hikmatyar eventually became Prime Minister, but only after leading his fighters in a civil war that claimed thousands of lives. Analysts suggest that his return is a turning point. Mr Hikmatyar's uh, arrival to Kabul is an historic event. Uh, it's been a pleasure not only to Afghans all over the country, but it's also a success to the National Unity Government uh, for making a, a suitable uh, reconciliation pact or an agreement with uh, its uh, uh, foes. The Afghan president appears optimistic. Today's gathering once again proved that the government of Afghanistan is strongly committed and would not let go any means and sacrifices to bring peace. Other Afghans are not so happy, and many politicians would like Hikmatyar behind bars and not making speeches. Miriam Hond, Al Jazeera. Pakistan has closed a key border crossing with Afghanistan after accusing Afghan forces of targeting its troops and civilians. Pakistan's military says Afghan forces opened fire on soldiers protecting census staff near the southwestern border town of Shaman. At least nine people were killed and another 33 injured. Pakistan is currently conducting its first door-to-door -door population census in 19 years. Afghan police say Pakistani officials had crossed the border. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump has signed a long-awaited religious liberty executive order. It's designed to protect freedom of religion by relaxing rules blocking church leaders from advocating political causes. Kimberly Halkett reports. No one should be censoring sermons or targeting pastors. In the White House Rose Garden, surrounded by leaders of many faiths, Donald Trump delivered on a campaign promise, signing an executive order making it easier for religious groups to participate in politics. I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment. Throughout his campaign, Trump criticized what's known in the U.S. as the Johnson Amendment, a 1954 law banning faith leaders from advocating for a political candidate or cause. Violation could result in millions of dollars in government fines. This executive order directs the IRS not to unfairly target churches and religious organizations for political speech. Noticeably absent from this order is a provision that gay rights activists feared. An earlier draft leaked in February of the religious order indicated there would be a provision for groups and organizations to allow them to deny services if there was a conflict with their religious beliefs. On Wednesday, before the executive order signing, gay rights activists protested in anticipation. There's concern the current White House order still allows groups to deny health care plans that include contraception and abortion services. The American Civil Liberties Union says it will challenge the order. But the president argues the religious liberty order is necessary to protect a tradition of partisan politics in American mosques, synagogues, and churches. I've been to the mountaintop. Citing as an example the civil rights movement of the 1960s. There is no greater example than the historic role of the African American church as the agent for social progress, sparing our nation to greater justice and equality. But Trump's order does not change any U.S. law. It simply instructs the U.S. Tax Department to cease targeting religious groups, making his religious liberty action mostly symbolic. Kimberly Halkett, Al Jazeera, Washington. 
The mandate for a contingent of West African troops deployed in Gambia has been extended. Gambia is struggling to rebuild its armed forces after mass graves were discovered in March. Police believe the victims were killed by members of the Gambian army on orders from the now exiled former president Yahya Jami. Nicholas Hark reports from Banjo. This is Mamin Sise's son, El Haji, and his best friend, Ibu Jaba. The two Gambian Americans went missing in 2013. One worked in IT in Texas, the other in a Walmart in Long Island. Together, they came to Gambia to start a cashew nut business as a way to give back to their country of origin. She wrote to the former president, Yaya Jame, for help. Now, police say he ordered their killing. They sit down with Yaya Jame, and Yaya Jame talked to them. So I don't know what Yaya Jame talked to them. But after Yaya Jame talked to them, he told the, the, the Gambian military, Go and cut these guys to pieces. No, 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 no. Not yet. Their bodies were found in March, buried in the backyard of Jami's farmhouse. Police are investigating human rights crimes he and his military are accused of committing after unearthing mass graves across the country. Jami has left Gambia, forced into exile after West African forces intervened in January. But the feared Gambian Republican guards are still here. They're now under the command of West Africa's stabilizing force. We're trying to gain confidence from the Gambian people. We want to get away from politics and restart a new military. That we will be defending and protecting the people that we serve. But the new government says it will take time. Patrols like these allow the new government to pursue their investigations on crimes committed by some members of the Gambian military. It allows them to do their work without fear. The West African forces have been well received by the Gambian population, but that popularity could wane if they stay too long. The government plans to set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to bring victims and perpetrators together, to give all sides the chance to express themselves in order to rebuild trust between people and the security forces. Let them freeze the Ayajamis assets all over the world, and anyone who was working for Yaya Jame for these dirty jobs, let them freeze their assets and bring Yaya Jame and everybody who was doing bad with him to Gambia to face justice. There was help it's a promise she's given to her son. She tells him, you have not died in vain. Others have been tortured like you, are buried like you, are missing like you. We will defend you. Justice will come. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Ben Jewel. Now the first medium-sized airliner built in China has taken off on its maiden voyage. It's designed to meet soaring demand for air travel there and challenge the dominance of Airbus and Boeing. Here's more from our China correspondent, Adrian Brown. This was an important milestone for Chinese aviation. Liftoff for its first domestically produced, but much delayed, large passenger jet. As the C-919 disappeared into overcast skies, state TV broadcast live pictures from multiple cameras. The maiden flight of this medium-range jet, with between 150 to 170 seats, has though taken time. It's at least three years behind schedule and is unlikely to be carrying passengers for another two years. The twin-engine jet represents China's attempt to challenge Boeing and Airbus in a very lucrative market. Another sign of how the country is moving up the value manufacturing chain, say analysts. China is not just producing shirts or sneakers. We need to produce our own airplanes and cars. If China only relies on American or European airplanes, it's not good for China. More than 500 C919s are on order, mostly from Chinese airlines. It's not entirely homemade. Key parts, including the engines, are foreign manufactured. China has the world's fastest growing aviation industry, driven by its rapidly expanding middle class. Boeing executives recently estimated almost 7,000 new aircraft will be needed in the next two decades. Another reminder of China's growing superpower reach. And last week there was another, when China's first domestically built aircraft carrier was unveiled. 
Six months ago, the new J-20 stealth fighter warplane made its debut. Now China's aviation industry is trumpeting another important technological advance. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, Beijing. India's space agency, meanwhile, has successfully launched a satellite to provide communications for neighboring countries in South Asia. Pakistan pulled out of the $36 million project. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, says the satellite is an invaluable gift to India's neighbors and an important step to enhance regional cooperation. Al Jazeera journalist Mahmoud Hussain, who's been held in an Egyptian prison, has had his detention extended for another 45 days. This happened earlier this week. Hussein is an Egyptian national. He was arrested while on holiday in December. He's accused of broadcasting false news to spread chaos, which he and Al Jazeera strongly deny. Al Jazeera is concerned for his health and demands his immediate release. As always, you'll find plenty more world news on our website, aljazeera.com. The very latest on all of our top stories there, aljazeera.com. Hello again, I'm Fuli Batibo with the headlines on Al Jazeera. Russia's defense ministry says the so-called safe zones agreed for Syria will come into force from midnight on Friday. The deal between Turkey, Russia and Iran was agreed on Thursday during talks in Kazakhstan. The safe zones will include areas in Idlib province, parts of Homs and eastern Ghouta. Meanwhile, U.S.-backed rebel forces say they are almost in complete control of the Syrian city of Tapka. The area is a key battleground as it's located around 50 kilometers from Raqqa, which is ISIL's self-declared capital. In Iraq, the army says at least 81 civilians have been killed in an airstrike in Mosul. This happened in a contested neighborhood on the western part of the city. The strike targeted an abandoned school used by families escaping fighting. In India, four men convicted of gang rape have lost appeals against their death sentences. Supreme Court judges in New Delhi upheld verdicts in their final uh, that they sh in their trial rather that they should be hanged. A 23-year-old woman died after she was beaten, raped, and tortured while travelling on a bus with a friend five years ago. The case brought nationwide protests and also worldwide attention on the mistreatment of women in India. In France, it's the final day of campaigning before Sunday's presidential election. The latest opinion polls show the centrist candidate Emmanuel Macron is leading over his far-right rival Marine Le Pen with just two days to go before voting. Meanwhile, 12 people have been arrested in Paris after environmental activists breached the Eiffel Tower security and displayed a banner aimed at the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. Algeria's ruling National Liberation Front party and its main allies have won a majority in the parliamentary elections there. The vote was overshadowed by plummeting oil prices and soaring unemployment. As expected, the turnout was low, with only about 38%. And finally, the ruling Conservative Party has made big gains in local elections across England, Scotland and Wales. The results are being seen as a sign of support before the general election next month. Prime Minister Theresa May hopes the Conservatives will win a bigger majority in Parliament to strengthen Britain's position in Brexit talks with the European Union. You're up to date with the headlines on Al Jazeera. Coming up next here, it's the stream. I hope you do stay with us. Thanks for watching.